So we work on viruses in my lab. Now, when I say that at parties, people usually take a step or two back. <laughs> and I think the people in the front row now wish they were probably sitting in the back row as well. But I'm here to tell you that I think viruses are getting a bad rap. That we have examples of where we, can where we have used viruses um, to help humanity. And I think we have a bright future where we can actually use them in ways that we are only starting to think about. And I think also I'll end with the idea that naturally uh, viruses are part of this web of life that, that we are part of, and they have uh, an important place in that web of life. So we as humans have actually been using viruses for our own good for at least a thousand years. Uh, this is a woodcut from 10th century China of a Chinese physician giving this patient a mild case of smallpox so that the patient would become immune to the smallpox and if they came in contact with live smallpox would survive. I want to take a few minutes to describe the procedure. So what they did is took scabs from people that are survived smallpox. Uh, they took pustules from cases that had but a few pustules and these pointed, round, red, and glossy, full of greenish yellow pus that became thick. Really smart. It <laughs> turns out that the most lethal form of smallpox is called black pox, where you get hemorrhaging into the pox. And they knew to stay away from that, because that was the nastiest form of smallpox. They then take the scabs, and the scabs could be used a, a, if they were one month old in spring or autumn, but in hot weathers, those scabs that have fallen could be used after 15 or 20 days. In winter, they had, to, they had to wait for 40 to 50 days. So what they were doing was letting the virus decay, letting the virus become inactivated, and they knew that in winter, they had to let that go a longer time because it was cold weather, but in summer, they could use it much earlier really incredibly brilliant. Um, take eight grains of desiccated scabs, two grains of uvularia grandiflora. Uvu uvularia grandiflora is bellwort. Uh, we don't know why they used bellwort. have no idea. Could be an adjuvant to stimulate the immune system. Could have antivirals to prevent complications. We simply don't know. Um, Pound them together in a clean earthen order, mortar. Select lucky and askew unlucky days for implanting. Employ for, employ for the operation a silver tube curved at the point. The silver tube curved at the point. Blow the prepared matter in the right nostril in the case of a boy and into the left nostril in the case of girls. Six days later, you get a fever. Uh, the people get sick. And then uh, most people get better, not one in 10, not one in 100 that does not recover. So about a 1% to 10% complication rate from this immunization. Of course, the complication was that you died of smallpox. <laughs> but it was worth it, because if smallpox swept through a village, 40 to 50% of people would die. And so even though this was a great risk, it was worth it. And this is the basis of immunizations that we've been doing for the last thousand years. But I wanna, I wanna suggest that maybe we can use viruses for something else. Maybe we can use viruses as little machines, which is what they are, that can go into our bodies and perhaps repair things. This is not a new idea. First idea came in um, 1966 with the movie The Fantastic Voyage. So for those of you who weren't born yet in 1966, uh, The Fantastic Mo Voyage was a movie where a scientist has um, a, a blood clot in the brain. And so what they do is they shrink down a submarine and shrink down a crew 
and inject the submarine and the crew into the vein of this person, and the submarine goes to the, uh, to the brain, and they use a laser to break the clot. Fantastic idea. <laughs> and for those of you who think that maybe viruses aren't, like we couldn't use viruses to do something like that, this is an image of a bacteriophage. This image is blown up about 10 million times. And so this, this thing is actually 10 million times smaller than what you're seeing on the screen. And I dare anybody in this building to make a more sophisticated lunar landing module. <laughs> and to show you how it works, the, these long legs give a soft landing onto the surface of the bacteria in this case. Then the module descends. And then you get a drill that actually starts drilling a hole into the membrane of the bacteria. And if, if just thinking about this as a drill isn't great enough, it turns out that the tip of the drill has a single molecule of iron on it. So this is an iron tip drill. And once you, dr once you drill all the way in, then you can inject the viral DNA and take over um, the cell. So can we use viruses as little machines to do things that we want them to do? So our first uh, uh, look at this was to do a search and destroy mission um, to see could we make viruses that can kill cancer. And there are a lot of people doing this in a lot of different ways. I'm going to just show you an example of one of the things that we do. Um, we took a mouse and we implanted human tumor tissue on, on both sides of the mouse. This, this is human melanoma, skin cancer. Um, and in the right hand tumor, we injected our uh, virus machine. And the virus machine was a genetically modified virus. Uh, we use vaccinia virus. And this is what you get if you'd use a low dose of virus. On the right-hand side, we completely got rid of the tumor. Now, this is a destroy mission. It's not a search and destroy mission, because we've injected the virus right into the tumor. But if we go into the, the right-hand tumor with a larger amount of virus, we can actually get rid of both tumors. So the virus can spread from one tumor to the other and destroy the second tumor. Now, it's really easy to cure cancer in mice. Curing cancer in humans, as we just heard about, is a whole lot more difficult. But I think what we're going to be seeing is um, use of technologies like this in the future as part of the arsenal for dealing with cancer. And in fact, uh, uh, technologies like this are currently in testing in humans, and they look uh, uh, promising. The work we've done is with a genetically modified virus. We took out part of a gene to inactivate the virus and give it properties that we wanted. The original um, oncolytic virus, these are called oncolytic viruses. The original oncolytic virus was a virus called Reovirus, discovered by Pat Lee about 15 years ago. Virtually everybody in this room has been infected with Reovirus. It's a virus that is, con con uh, uh, that is not conclusively known to cause any significant disease in humans. Um, but it's, and so it's believed that Reoviruses cause subclinical infections in the majority of people, as most people are seen to have antibodies to all three serotypes of Reovirus. So we've all been infected with a virus that can preferentially replicate in and kill cancer cells. And so is this part of a symbiotic relationship that we're having with our viruses um, so that they actually provide the generosity to help us fight our tumors? <laughs> so. What, what I've tried to do today is give you a couple of examples of how viruses can be harnessed for the good of humanity. 
and perhaps one uh, example of a natural service they may provide to us. And as we learn more about our place in this complex of web of life, I, I'm convinced we'll see more of this. And I think we'll also see more opportunities to be able to manipulate viruses uh, for the good of humanity. Um, I also hope that we don't think just of the good of humanity as we do this, because we are part of this very complex web of life. And so really, I'm hoping that as we learn more about this, we can use these little machines, perhaps to undo some of the damage that we as humans are doing uh, to this web of life. Thank you.